joining us for this look at the best original reporting from KPBS News This Week. I'm Amitha Sharma. Coming up, how are weather experts explaining the flooding that hit San Diego on Monday? That's part of our extensive coverage of this week's storm and the local recovery. A status check on how many people are experiencing homelessness. We'll show you the work done by volunteers for the point in time count. And San Diego makes changes to its surveillance policy. Watchdogs say it will weaken transparency. The week started with a disaster that many San Diegans may not recover from anytime soon. Intense rain brought widespread flooding, with Southeast San Diego among the hardest hit. Andrew Bowen, Melissa May, and Eric Anderson met with flood victims and meteorologists. This is my little home. This is my safe place, the place that I come and feel the most comfortable and safe and warm. Robert Lopez has lived in this apartment complex on National Avenue for about seven months. He was working an early shift as a restaurant manager downtown when the downpour started. He came home in the afternoon to this. I feel like I lost everything. It's devastating. The sudden and rapid rainfall overwhelmed San Diego's storm drain system. The apartments here sit right next to Choyas Creek, which quickly became clogged with trash and vegetation washed away from upstream. Lopez has no family in San Diego and is now homeless. I basically just, you know, <laughs> had a savior, I had an angel with me, uh, Sean. My best friend, you know, if it wasn't for her, I wouldn't have had a place to stay. To put this into perspective, the last storm of this severity was in the 1930s. San Diego Mayor Todd Gloria declared a state of emergency in response to the floods. He said Tuesday there was no way the city could have been fully prepared. Unprecedented event of this nature uh, with no loss of life is a miracle. Uh, but it was made possible because of the diligence of a lot of public servants uh, who stepped into the breach and a lot of neighbors who came together to support one another. We need that same kind of can-do spirit over the next number of weeks and months in order to make sure that everyone who's been impacted are able to survive this and hopefully come out of this uh, in, a, in a better place. Still, San Diego is well aware of its underfunded storm drain system. A report released just this month found the city would need to raise an additional $1.6 billion in taxes or fees to fund all of its storm drain needs. That's more than the unfunded needs of San Diego's roads, sidewalks, and streetlights combined. Andrew Bowen, KPBS News. The Grantville Station Business Park on Mission Gorge Road is right next to a part of the San Diego River that normally looks something like this. But after Monday's flooding, water overflowed over the concrete barriers and caused major damage to all the businesses, including Traveler Coffee Roaster and One Season Brewing. So the water stretched all the way, you couldn't even get into the parking lot. And uh, I just waited it out in horror, didn't sleep at all Monday night. That's owner Dan Romeo, who couldn't believe what he saw when he walked into his business on Tuesday. To be honest with you, I mean, this has been, you know, six years of hard work, so I cried, <laughs> you know. Um, yeah, I mean, it's all gone at the end of the day. And, uh, you know, just for it to end like this. Romeo says his business had never really recovered from the pandemic and was actually in the process of selling some of his assets. But now they're you know, they're worthless. You know everything here just got destroyed. I'm in the in the middle of just trying to put the pieces together and trying to salvage whatever can be salvaged over the next couple of weeks. And I don't yeah I don't have flood insurance, so this is all just a massive loss. Romeo says he doesn't have the funds for repairs and has to close down. The space looks like um, like a hurricane came through here. It was just wild. And this wasn't even the worst unit. <laughs> I mean, in this area. Uh, some of these other units are, it's even crazier. Like Native Poppy, located at the end of the business park. So I opened the door, just like water rushed out and just all of our merchandise and gifts and supplies were just rushing by me. Native Poppy founder Natalie Gill says their warehouse looked like an aquarium. The whole warehouse was filled with three feet of water. You can see the water lines in here, they're like waist high. The first call Gill made was to her insurance broker. I was panicking, um, but I mean, without flood insurance, and he said even if we did have flood insurance, like 
that doesn't necessarily mean everything would be covered. So I don't know. I think that all, like so many San Diegans right now, this was a disaster. Like, I don't think anybody knows how to proceed. Gil and Romeo each estimate at least $100,000 in damage. And Native Poppy is still recovering from a car crashing into one of their flower shops a year and a half ago. For some reason, this just feels different. This feels sadder, heavier. California Department of Insurance Deputy Commissioner Michael Soller says flooding like this is becoming more common. A climate change exacerbating uh, extreme weather conditions and, you know, communities seeing flooding that maybe had never seen it before. Um, and, and um, you know, so unfortunately, that's not the time that you want to learn that that your homeowner's insurance or your business coverage doesn't cover flooding. Um, but that's unfortunately what a lot of people find out. The Insurance Information Institute recommends reporting damages to San Diego County. The county is collecting a damage assessment survey so they can assess the extent of the damage and advocate to the state and federal governments for assistance. Melissa May, KPBS News. The rain that drenched San Diego on Monday created an out-of-control torrent of water in southeast San Diego. Craig Montoya stood outside of his house on Beta Street. The water came up all the way to about the four-foot mark on that front door. The inside of the house is total, total. The brown water raged along the concrete canyon, flowing over its banks. Trees were uprooted, fences were pulled down, and cars got tossed around and dragged into the muddy floodwaters, raging toward San Diego Bay. Deluge overwhelmed Joyous Creek, where houses sit next to the concrete channel and spots, it's exactly the kind of thing Groundwork San Diego has been working to avoid. Choice Creek has many, many branches, and many of them do have concrete channels. And what happens when the water hits, you know, the, when the stormwater hits the street, it goes into a storm drain, goes into the concrete channel. It wants to go out as quick as possible. The downpour came mostly on Monday morning, with several inches of rain falling in the space of just a few hours. Look at the fence posts. I mean, for that to happen, that's got to be an awful lot of force. Cars were carried away, again, because the water was going too fast. And if we have the room, make it wider, slow down the water, it's not quite as impactful. The National Weather Service says storms like this one are not uncommon in the region, but the intensity of the rainfall got people's attention. San Diego has a long history of flooding, but El Nino and climate change played a role. All the climate change is really doing is it's making it a little more extreme. Um, it, sometimes it's dry, sometimes it's wet, sometimes it's warm and cold, but it's exacerbating uh, a condition that's already in place. Even though the atmospheric river never actually came ashore, the storm pushed enough rainfall into the county to lift seasonal rainfall totals out of a deficit to just above normal for this time of year. Atmospheric rivers can be very beneficial because they bring up to about 50 percent of our precipitation and we need that right we need water it fills our reservoirs it's good for the landscapes but when they last too long or are too intense in period um, they can be hazardous rain is moving out of the region for a little while the next storm is expected in early february eric anderson kpbs news our coverage of the storm is the focus of this week's KPBS Roundtable that includes KPBS reporter Gustavo Solis with the storm's impact on Tijuana. Roundtable airs Friday at noon on KPBS FM with replays throughout the weekend. You can also stream it at kpbs.org and all major podcast platforms. Early Thursday morning, work got underway that will determine the region's approach to homelessness. KPBS covered the annual point in time count in San Diego and North County. Here are those stories from KPBS reporters John Carroll and Jacob Ayer. Are you currently experiencing homelessness because you're playing domestic violence? 16th Street in the East Village, well before dawn, it's cold and still damp from Monday's deluge. Two volunteers from Father Joe's Villages wearing orange safety vests set out on their task. They ask questions, some perfunctory. Date of birth? September 8th, 1959. Others produce answers that are heartbreaking. Is this the first time you've been homeless in your well, life? 
got a November 6th. The nonprofit Downtown San Diego Partnership says since the city's safe sleeping sites opened, the number of homeless in the downtown area has dropped from about 1,200 in May of last year to fewer than 900 now. Later in the morning, we came down here to the city's first safe sleeping site, the one located right next to the city operations yard. It's also located right next to this major storm drain. So as you might imagine, on Monday, things got very wet very fast down here. The water was literally up to almost my kneecaps. It was that bad. Seth Estep actually lives in the city's larger safe sleeping site on the edge of Balboa Park. It's known as the O-Lot, but he works down at this site. He says the O-Lot fared better in Monday's torrential rain, but living in a tent during a deluge is difficult. They leak in the cold. They hold a lot of cold weather in, and it just it gets you really cold in there. Thank God I got, you know, my sleeping bag, and I got a blanket that keeps me warm at night. We asked Councilman Stephen Whitburn to join us this morning. He was the driving force behind the city's encampment ban and the creation of the safe sleeping sites. Here at the 20th at B safe sleeping site, uh, there was some water, uh, so we uh, moved people out of this site uh, and into temporary shelter for a couple of days. Uh, this dried out pretty quickly, so they're back now. Everything's fine. Everything is most definitely not fine for those still on the streets, like Frank Gentili, who rode up on his bike while we were shooting this story. I feel really unsafe. I feel like I'm going crazy, man. I really am. You know, I'm fighting with the drugs. I need some type of help. I need help really bad. A staffer here told Gentilly where to go to get that help, to get into a tent here where there is security and there are services that can help people transition into housing. So you guys know you can go to the Neil Vacation. The point in time count will continue this evening, a data point that will put a number on the human tragedy of homelessness. John Carroll, KPBS News. Hey, where's the play at? <laughs> it was an early wake-up call, a 4 a.m. start for nearly 60 volunteers in Vista who took part in the one-night snapshot of the region's homeless population, known as the point-in-time count. You're looking for people that are covering their windows at night, so somebody that might have a sunshade up, somebody that has a bunch of trash in the back of the vehicle, right? KPBS joined a team of three volunteers, Catherine Manis, Joanne Foss, and Alicia Tabarez as they set out in the dark to cover their assigned district along the Vista San Marcos border. I, I work with a lot of the families who um, unfortunately don't have a house or are living in their vehicles. Driving through business parks, canyons, and almost everywhere in between, the group searched for people without a proper home. It's not a perfect system. Volunteers look for clues to give them insight on where people may be sleeping. But we did find several families living in their, like in the RVs, in their cars, individuals who are, um, you know, working also. During the four hours of scanning, the team encountered numerous people without homes and interviewed those who were willing to talk. One of them was Jason, who didn't want to use his last name. We're, we're there, there's some good people out here, and trying hard, working hard, doing their part. I've always, like, I've, I've always paid taxes. I've always held a job. I've never taken a subsidy from the government. I've never taken food stamps and always supported my children. Always done that all the time. He was a longtime Oceanside resident and became homeless in the city six years ago. Now he sleeps in a van near his place of work in Vista. He says the cost of food, gas, and housing are just too much. Prices were going up in rent, especially here in San Diego. Couldn't afford to live, you know. My wife at the time was, she was permanently disabled with asthma, had two children. On a single income, just couldn't afford it anymore. The data from the point in time count really matters. It's used to determine how to distribute federal homeless relief funding. Sturman says those funds should go towards a regional solution. North County homelessness isn't necessarily a singular city problem. We have the Sprinter line up here, this was 78 corridor, right? And so a lot of our clients travel across that 78 corridor. One night they might be in Escondido, the next night they might be in Vista, Oceanside, Carlsbad. As for Tabarez, who grew up in Vista and was forced out of the county due to cost of living, it's personal. The concerns that I have for the community where I grew up in, it's been a lot of just not having access to affordable housing. 
Official numbers for the full count are expected in the late spring or early summer. Jacob Ayer, KPBS News. San Diego is a leader among cities that are updating their zoning laws to allow for more housing. But most of the new homes being built are studios and one-bedroom apartments. KPBS Metro reporter Andrew Bowen says there's a growing movement to make family-sized apartments easier to build with a simple change to the building code. Between this building and here will be a small courtyard that will become a shared courtyard for those who live here, as well as the seven families in this unit here. David Pearson is showing me around the backyard of a house in San Diego's Grant Hill neighborhood. He's the architect on a small apartment building here that's set to break ground this summer. This project is a good example of what we do. Uh, it's keeping the home up front. It's adding seven units in the back. Those units are gonna be uh, studios and two bedrooms. Uh, the two bedrooms will have a den slash office space that could be used uh, even for a nursery and uh, in a flexible way. Designing buildings is complicated and every inch counts. Pearson says he was able to incorporate these family-sized apartments by designing the project with only one staircase. He says so-called single stair buildings offer architects more flexibility. Less of the building is taken up by hallways and staircases. That makes it easier to incorporate two- and three-bedroom apartments with windows on multiple sides. So it's a nice light-filled unit uh, that can rely less on, you know, artificial lighting. It can rely less on expensive mechanical equipment to heat and cool because the, the residents of that home have just more control of of how to open a window and create a nice breeze through the unit. Here's the catch. In most of the United States, single stair buildings cannot be taller than three stories. That makes them less attractive for home builders. They're incentivized to design apartments like hotels, with two staircases on opposite sides of the building connected by a long hallway. Pearson is part of a growing movement to bring the local and state building codes in line with Europe, Latin America, and Asia, where single stair buildings can go up to six stories, sometimes taller. My initial reaction was a bit of concern. Tony Tosca is San Diego's fire marshal. He oversees building inspections to make sure they meet life and safety requirements. The three-story limit on single-stair buildings emerged in the early 20th century as apartment fires were ravaging American cities. Building regulators wanted to ensure as residents were evacuating from a fire, firefighters could still get in. People are going up there to effectively do rescue and fight fires and set up their operations. People are also coming out. So there's this, you know, competing factor. That that's a huge concern for me. At the same time, Tosca acknowledges fire prevention and suppression technology has advanced in leaps and bounds. California requires sprinkler systems in every new apartment building. Furniture has to be fire resistant. That's why Tosca is keeping an open mind. Definitely housing is an important issue here in California, specifically in San Diego. Um, as long as there's something that maintains that life safety aspect, uh, we're all in support of it but we're just gonna make sure that you know it's done the right way. The way that we modify zoning versus modify building code are two different animals. Ed Mendoza is policy director for the Livable Communities Initiative, which is advocating for single stair reform. It supported a law passed last year that directed the state fire marshal to do a study on the safety of single stair apartment buildings. Mendoza says that study needs to look at real world examples. He says Seattle legalized single stair buildings up to six stories in the 1970s, and there's been no measurable trade off on safety. We want to argue for this type of reform in good faith. You know, we don't want hearsay. We don't want anecdotes. We want, we want, you know, facts. And, um, and hopefully the facts carry us through. Mendoza and David Pearson met with an aide to San Diego Mayor Todd Gloria last year to discuss local single-stair reform. Pearson hopes city officials take the idea to heart. I would like to see the city look at building code reform as a means to, to create, you know, good, safe, designed family units um, that ultimately provide more, more freedom of choice for, for residents of San Diego to stay put in San Diego and not move out to the suburbs. The statewide study on single stair reform is due to be completed by the end of this year. Andrew Bowen, KPBS News. 
A former whites-only neighborhood could become San Diego's largest historic district to date. KPBS reporter Katie Heisen looked into why critics say it would reinforce racial divides. This is a very common feature of these hacienda-style houses, these California ranches, is this kind of ornate woodwork on the garage door. Laura Henson points out the house on Norma Drive's distinct Depression-era features tile roofing, and enclosed courtyard. It's one of more than 400 properties that could be protected if the city's preservation board votes Thursday to recommend Talmadge as a historic district. Henson says it's important to preserve the history of these homes, financed by Hollywood elite and subsidized by the Roosevelt's New Deal. Critics say there's another side to that history. Their films included racist portrayals. The subsidies almost never extended to black home buyers, And the neighborhood marketed itself as whites only, boosting property values. Today, the city lists Talmadge as one of three racially segregated areas of wealth. Hi. Good morning. How are you? Wesley Morgan says naming it a historic district would worsen this divide by increasing home prices, decreasing property taxes, and slowing housing development. The historic resource part as a whole is, a, is definitely a form of privilege where those who have the resources to invest in spending the time to look at history and write reports benefit from all of the privilege that they were able to put into that effort. He says that lack of diversity fails the rest of San Diego. The majority of people will never live in a historic district. They can't afford to live there. And those are our highest resource areas. Those are the areas with the best schools, with the safest streets. The board will vote Thursday at 1 p.m. Katie Heisen, KPBS News. That story by Katie Heisen was one of our most popular this week. Here are some others. San Diego County is offering down payment assistance to first-time home buyers. Solar adoption is declining in California after new rules take hold. And of course, our storm coverage will have more of it in the days ahead. You can also find these stories at the KPBS YouTube page. The San Diego City Council has approved substantial changes to the city's surveillance transparency law. Scott Rod reports that privacy advocates say the changes water down hard-fought reforms. San Diego has had a rocky history with surveillance technology. In 2016, for example, the city rolled out so-called smart streetlights equipped with cameras, which police began to review without the public knowing. So privacy rights advocates celebrated in 2022 when the city passed an ordinance requiring the review of all surveillance equipment within one year. Fast forward to today, that deadline has been pushed back by several years, few technologies have been fully vetted, and privacy rights advocates sound like this. We are furious. Today's vote is a time to show the people watching that you stand by your words. I'm not adverse to updating the privacy ordinance for clarity or good faith adjustments, but these mass exem exemptions cannot be allowed. That was Lily Irani and Talitha Wright speaking during the city council's regular meeting on Tuesday. The council voted to exempt technologies such as surveillance cameras and police databases from review. Mayor Todd Gloria's office pushed for the changes, arguing the ordinance is too broad and would require time-consuming reviews for basic tools, including email newsletter software and social media apps. And the changes will likely keep coming. Here's Councilmember Marnie Von Wilpert, who chairs the city's Public Safety Committee. I will bring this ordinance forward for amendments as often as we need, because we are going to have to work to get this right. I'm now sorry, the voting system, please cast your vote. Council members approved the changes with a 6-2 to two vote. Scott Rod, KPBS News. The storm in San Diego isn't the only big environmental news this week. Another landslide in Orange County is disrupting train traffic. Alexander Wynn has details on when the tracks will reopen. The Los Angeles-San Diego-San Luis Obispo Rail Corridor, or LOSAN, is the second busiest intercity rail corridor in the nation, according to the San Diego Association of Governments. 
It's San Diego's only rail connection to the rest of the nation. So when rail traffic stops because a landslide threatens the tracks, it not only disrupts passenger service. There was a woman there who was Spanish speaking and she had ridden the train from Riverside and she landed at the Laguna Niguel Mission Viejo station and she was trying to get to Vista. She didn't know the trains had been closed down and she was stuck. It also disrupts commerce. Just as important are the billion dollars in commerce that flows through the rail corridor every year. Congressman Mike Levin highlights that point during his news conference today, announcing funding to replace the 109-year-old San Diego Railway River Bridge. This morning, you know, we had uh, hoped to go all the way up to Los Angeles and Union Station. Instead, Levin ended his rail trip in Oceanside before driving to San Clemente to tour the landslide, which took out a pedestrian bridge. Mother Nature will win. Mother Nature always wins. And we have to be mindful uh, that regardless of what we do with this corridor, if it stays where it is or if parts of it are relocated, Regardless, any event, it's going to take significant federal investment. That's where the $53.8 million in funding from the bipartisan infrastructure bill comes in. It will be used to replace the bridge, moving it from a single track to a double track and raising the bridge by eight feet because of sea level rise. It will also add a special stop at the Del Mar Fairgrounds. State Senator Catherine Blakespear says it's a precursor to moving the tracks underground and away from the bluffs in Del Mar. The train is our solution, part of our solution to the climate crisis, to our equity concerns, to reducing congestion on local roads, to improving the well-being and health of communities. A few years ago, several bluff collapses in Del Mar disrupted rail service on the corridor. Now that's happening in San Clemente. In the past 18 months, several landslides have happened here in San Clemente. Over there is where Castle Romantica happened, and now this landslide. San Clemente's council member Chris Duncan was not pleased, but he says the corridor should reopen in a few days. It's frustrating for me, but it's really frustrating for our residents, right, who get to enjoy this beach trail. Securing funding for future infrastructure needs on the corridor is why Levin also announced today half a million dollars in additional funding to get Losan onto the corridor ID program. The program helps ID critical rail infrastructure needs. Alexander Wynn, KPBS News. We hope you enjoyed this look at KPBS News this week. I'm Amitha Sharma. Thank you for joining us.